بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى جل جلاله وعم نواله والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد So in the previous session we had discussed in the last two three sessions we've been discussing what spirituality is all about and then he moved on from saying that if you want to attain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and high levels then you must adhere very regularly and punctually to dhikr of Allah but the dhikr of Allah that we do the remembrance of Allah that we make has to be done with certain etiquette and adab to get the best out of it so this is with everything in the world <clears throat> whatever we do if you follow the proper procedure for it then you get the most out of it taking medicines at certain times not having certain foods when you take those medicines in everything it's like that where you must do something so that you get the proper benefit of it because everything has been designed to be done in a particular way and to do it in a way that doesn't link to something else which is going to negate its effect so this is just like with a lot of things in this world so likewise with uh, with dhikr uh, th this is what may be the fact that if we're not doing if we're doing dhikr and we're not seeing the effect of it maybe it's the adab so that's why we went through the adab and the adab was split up into the pre-adab the adab while you're doing dhikr and the etiquette after dhikr so then the author says that فَإِن دَاوَمْتَ عَلَى الذِّكْرِ بِهَذِهِ الْآدَابِ تَرْقَى أَيْ تَسْعُدْ وَتَسْعُدْ بِهَذَا الذِّكْرِ الْمُشْتَمِلْ عَلَى الْآدَابِ أَيْ بِسَبَبِهِ أَعْلَى الرُّتَبِ If you are regular on your remembrance, on your dhikr regimen, using or observing these adab, then you will ascend to, you will climb up to, you will be escalated to, to the highest of levels in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are these highest levels? So then he describes them, he says that these high levels, they are something related to this world and something related to the hereafter. He says the aspect which is related is Al Khaliqatul Hasana Al Mahmuda Aqibatuha. You will develop a praiseworthy nature, praiseworthy character by doing this dhikr. You will develop a praiseworthy character which it will be an excellent character which will be praiseworthy in the hereafter as well. See, you might be thinking, if I just do dhikr, how does that improve my character? Generally, when you do dhikr, it softens out your heart. When the heart becomes softer, you reflect on a lot more things. When your heart is soft, you're more compassionate. You're more merciful. You're more caring, you're more selfless. Heart is hard, you're more selfish. You focus more on the dunya. The heart is soft, it's easier for the other, uh, the, the other lessons that we may be receiving or the other <coughs> mawa'id, which means <coughs> counsels that we may be listening to on a Friday or any other lecture or somebody else tells us something. Normally, because we have a hard heart, they just bounce back off. It doesn't make a big difference to us. But when the heart softens out, then you're willing to accept the good wherever it is. It affects you. So when somebody says something, those who have a soft heart, they're generally going to be affected by it. Those who have a hard heart, it's just going to be, oh, it wasn't entertaining enough. We're going to look at the outer facade of something like that. Because we're not focused on trying to take a lesson from what it is, however it is. We want something to entertain us. Yes, that was a wonderful program. You know, I go to some place and uh, you've given a lecture and there's been a lot of people and you can tell they're, you know. Um, so everyone that was a wonderful lecture. And then you just feel like, man, it was just probably entertainment. I hope it's just not entertainment. Because now you know how to speak well, you can tell nice stories, or you can you know, relate to certain important aspects. That's just all entertainment, to be honest. I mean, it's a religious entertainment. That, okay, made you feel good. It didn't get you bored in the hour that you sat with me. So at least you weren't bored. But do you go from here and do something with it? Has it really affected you? Has it made you reflect? We need a soft heart for that. To be able to benefit from anything, even if the least eloquent person says something. 
when the verses of Quran are recited, it zadatum imana. It increases them in iman. This was the state of the Sahaba. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا When the verses of Allah were recited in front of them, it increased them in the iman. That's really what it is. Otherwise, today we're looking for entertaining speakers. And anybody who wants to become an effective speaker, they have to learn how to make sure they <coughs> say the right things and otherwise people get bored. So that's what he's saying. That if you do dhikr, then inshallah the heart will become soft, then you'll be able to benefit. وَأَدْنَ الرُّتَبِ الْإِسْلَامِيَّةِ لَوْمُ النَّفْسِ عَلَى مَا صَدَرَ مِنْهَا مِنَ الْمُخَالَفَاتِ Now he's talking about all of the different stages that this can take us through. The benefit of dhikr will provide these different levels of ascendancy. So the highest, obviously, is that you'll be able to attain this character, inshallah, eventually. Of course, you have to supplement it with knowledge. We have to learn things because you can't learn it just for yourself. But you have to be uh, educated about it and become aware of it. And then the hereafter will be praiseworthy. But he says that even the lowest category or level that you will attain by doing the dhikr of Allah is lawmun nafs. Ala ma sadara minha min al You will actually start blaming yourself. We will actually start being concerned about ourselves and being... Um, tougher on ourselves about any wrongdoing that we do because generally one of the biggest problems is when a wrongdoing becomes part of our life and we don't consider it wrong anymore meaning we don't feel we may consider it wrong you know if somebody really told us and reminded us of it but there's no guilt about it anymore so by doing dhikr it creates an awareness of Allah the taqwa is building taqwa god fearingness so then even the smallest things that we may have as part of our life that we didn't even bat an eyelid about uh, for before, now we'll actually start thinking, no man, this is wrong. I need to don't not do this kind of stuff. I need to stop doing this. Once we can think that I need to stop doing this, that's a wonderful place to be. Because if I don't feel like I need to stop because I don't even know I'm doing anything wrong, then that's even worse. So that's the minimal benefit of doing dhikr of Allah that it will actually make us censor ourselves, make us feel guilty. وَعَلَاهَا رُتْبَةً الصِّدِّيقِيَّةً And the highest of these levels, if we're, if we're defining the level, is you'll gain Siddiqiyah. Siddiqiyah is the status of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Absol absolute verification of the truth and acting the truth, not just claiming the truth, not just to say that I believe in the truth, but to actually become, every action of ours becomes a true action, for the sincere action for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, يَنَالُهَا الْعَبْدُ بَعْدَ دُخُولِهِ فِي مَقَامِ الْإِحْسَانِ That is the status of Ihsan. That once you enter this state, a station of Ihsan, uh, of this excellence of faith, then a person will attain the status of Siddiqiyah. So it begins with the feeling of remorse over what we're doing is wrong, wanting to correct ourselves. We may continue to do wrong things, but we've got a guilt. And having a guilt associated with the wrong we do is better than having no guilt when, you, when we do something wrong. It's not there yet, but it's definitely better than having no guilt, because when you have no guilt, then it's a free ride. And we don't even know. We're going in the wrong direction. Now, he's going to describe all of these different levels, so um, just wait, uh, don't, don't get confused by this. All these different levels is actually explained. So this level of Ihsan that you get, that you have to reach uh, to gain Siddiqiyya, absolute sincerity and truthfulness, that is the state which is described as وَهُوَ أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَى When you are now able to worship Allah as though you're seeing Him. So you're not just doing worship for application, but you're actually understanding that Allah is in front of you and I'm doing this to show Allah. I'm not just doing it for any other reason. Now, remember it said that the highest level is the Siddiqiyya stage. But the Siddiqiyya stage has a number of different levels within that, sub-levels. So the Rutbatu Siddiqiyya in itself has maratib mutafawita, has different levels. 
بعضها أعلى من بعضين. Of course, some are going to be higher than the others because it's a successive um, order. وأعلىها رتبة أبي بكر الصديق رضي الله عنه. And the person who actually attained that highest highest level, at least one person who attained that highest level, is is Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiAllahu an. Now, if you want to understand what this level is, then just read the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiAllahu an. How he reacted in every single instance that he confronted. What did he do? The people of Makkah came to him and they said, "You know, your friend, because they were friends, right, with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Your friend is saying that he cl- he claims that he went up to the moon." Imagine somebody comes to you and say, you know, your friend, he's, he, say, he claims that last night he went up to the moon and came back. Now you're going to think, even if it's your best friend right now, you're going to think you're crazy. Right? I didn't know that he was you know, going to NASA or something like that. But he believed in the Prophet ﷺ truth so much that even this extra order, in fact today for somebody to say that I've been to the moon is much easier than for the Muslims of the time of the Prophet ﷺ to have accepted that the Prophet ﷺ went up to the seventh heaven. Because there was nothing. I mean, you, you couldn't even go to, from Makkah, you couldn't even go to Medina Munawwara in a night. Now you can, but then you couldn't. Not even to Makkah, not even to Medina, not even maybe to Jeddah. It took days to do these things. And you're talking about going up there, Today, it's a, all of these things are possibilities. Okay, within the realm of possibilities, I will believe that yes, absolutely, maybe he won a lucky strike. He's always, you know, doing lucky things anyway, right? So maybe he, he won, you know, a, he, he won a ticket from Virgin Galactic and this is their first space to the moon or something and they just, mashallah, he was a lucky guy, he was in the right place at the right time and they just took him. It's a possibility today. But in those days, for somebody to believe that, that it was just out of the world. It was like saying today that <clears throat> somebody's been to <clears throat> the star, such and such a star, which is like, un, you know, we haven't even been to all the pl- planets. We don't even have the ability to go to all the planets, but you go to the star, which is even further away. It's like saying that. In fact, even more than that. So Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu can you imagine how he believed that? There was a level of veracity. Now, you, you know, you might say that, but maybe he's just blinded. He just believes anything he says. Well, you know Abu Bakr Siddiq, he's not like that. From his other things, that would corroborate that he's not a crazy guy who just believes in anything. You tell him anything, he believes you. No. He ran the Muslim lands for two and two and a half years after the Prophet ﷺ. And he was one of the most trusted people of the Prophet ﷺ with a very balanced understanding. That means the reason he accepted it was not because he was just an, a walkover person that you can convince of any, anything. It's not the reason. And then he's also saying that, yes, if that's what the Prophet ﷺ is claiming, then I agree with it. So if you're making this up, then I don't agree with it. But if that's what the Prophet ﷺ said, then I can believe it. Because I can believe anything he says, because I know him. It was that real strong connection with the Prophet ﷺ that he had that allowed him to believe it. When you know somebody and then they claim something, it's, it's like you, know, you can take it based on your understanding of them. So that's the state of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an. وَلَا يَعْلُوا مَقَامَ الصِّدِّيقِيَةِ إِلَّا مَقَامُ النُّبُوَّةِ Once you get to the maqam of Siddiqiyya, then the, the next level after that is nubuwa, is prophecy, and you can't get there. But it's saying that the, Abu Bakr radiallahu an got to that highest stage, because after that, the next level is nubuwa, and which you can't really work for. That one is just a special given one. That's a special place that you can't make any effort to get to. <clears throat> and now as you know that it's even stopped it's, it's closed forever because the last prophet came فَصَاهِبُ مَقَامِ الصِّدِّقِيَّةِ لَوْ تَخَطَّى مَقَامَهُ لَنَزَلَ فِي مَقَامِ النُّبُوَّةِ Meaning this status of Siddiqiyya is so close right? it's so high up there that if logically speaking if the person who is at that stage was to go any further he would become a prophet but obviously you can't do that you're just trying to say how high this stage is إِلَّا أَنَّ النُّبُوَّةَ قَدْ خُتِمَتْ بِنَبِيِّنَا مُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وسلم. Prophecy has ended and been sealed by our Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. But was Siddiqiyyatu lam tukhtam. The level of Siddiqiyya has not been sealed. The doors for Siddiqiyya are open. People can still ascend there. فَمَقَامُ الصِّدِّيقِيَّةِ So what is مَقَامُ الصِّدِّيقِيَّةِ? What's another word for it? Is مَقَامُ الْوِلَايَةِ الْكُبْرَى وَالْخِلَافَةِ الْعُظْمَى 
The status of Siddiqiyya is the status also of the highest wilaya, the highest level of becoming a wali of Allah. People become wali before that, but this is the highest wali, the highest friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, it's not far-fetched to believe that if the Prophet ﷺ was the most beloved to Allah, then the one who's most beloved to him is going to be somewhere close up there because, I mean, you take your friends where you go. That's how you get people into places. You know, you're, in fact, in some cases, if you have a membership, somebody, you're allowed to bring a companion along. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq goes there. Aisha radiallahu anh gets there because when the Prophet was once asked, who's the most beloved? He said, Aisha. Who, who's next? His father, her father. So anybody who criticized Abu Bakr or Aisha radiallahu anha, they're just crazy. It's like, why wouldn't the Prophet sallallahu take his closest companion, the one who allowed to be closest to the masjid, the one his, whose daughter he married, the one who with him, who, 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 with whom he was in the ghar, in the cave, right? In the most emotional and sensitive, delicate moments he was with him. Like, is your brain dead? Like, to think that this is the wrong person he chose all of his life. What kind of a prophet do you believe you have if he chose the wrong friend that you can criticize Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an? I just don't understand where they get this narrative from. It's a proper shaitani narrative to believe that Abu Bakr radiallahu an was a problematic individual with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he got it wrong and then he married his daughter as well and he stayed married to her and then he died in, in her lap. Like what's wrong with your brain? You know, where, where's your intelligence gone? But that just shows you the nature of this world, to be honest. That something's so clear cut and logical, you can misinterpret it. Doesn't matter how intelligent you are. Because true understanding comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this maqam of Siddiqiyya is the maqam of Wilayatul Kubra and Al Khilafatul Uzma, the highest level of vicegerency of Allah. That you know, when you represent Allah truly. <clears throat> If you get to this stage, then you really truly represent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mission in this world. وَهَذَا الْمَقَامِ تَتَرَادَ فِيهِ الْفُتُوحَاتِ Once you get to this maqam, there's going to be numerous openings that will beset you. You'll be able to understand so much more, which will just make you even more convinced. Futuhat. Openings, victories. Not from a dunyawi perspective. Doesn't mean you become wealthy. It means that spiritually you become a lot more understanding. You might be saying, well man, let's talk about the, the lower levels first. Right? He's just talking about starting with the higher levels. <clears throat> and then he says, what wa ta'zum at the manifestations of the truth become so clear for you. You you hardly then get deceived by anything right? because it's just so clear what you want in life then you don't get mixed up with the wrong things you're at that level where as the hadith mentions I think which we've done here before maybe which is that you become the hand with which you touch and the eyes with which you see and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then governs basically everything for us He helps us out with everything وَتَتِمُّ الْمُشَاهَدَاتِ وَالْكُشُوفَاتِ Your unveilings and witnessing all of that will become completed. لِكَمَالِ nafs وَحُسْنِ sifatiha, Because your nafs has become completely purified. It's become perfected, accomplished. And its characteristic has become excellent. And the reason why many things are prevented from us and why we still get, get deluded is because the nafs has some evil in there. The nafs have some darkness in there. And if that is the case, then we're not going to be able to see through the wrong. It's going to be embellished to us. Shaitan still has a part in us. As long as we've got black spots in our heart, the shaitan has an inside companion, an inside associate. So when that becomes cleaned up, and the way, the way to polish the heart is through the dhikr of Allah, remember, that's what he started off with, right? That you get this through lots and lots of dhikr of Allah. So when you do that, and the heart becomes completely clean, then no longer can it be affected as so easily, unless you start letting your guard down. Because there's a constant state of polish that has to take place, because as we walk around even, we're going to be affected by things that, we're not, that, that are not appropriate for us. That's why vicar is necessary to keep it, keep it clean. It's like anything else. Even if you don't use something, it gets dusty. 
Like if somebody had, if something has been not washed for a year right, and it's just been kept, you still want to wash it. Because you know what's going to come. We know there's bacteria and things like that that go around anyway. So it's similar, similar, similar to that. وَلَا يُمْكِنُ الْوُصُولِ إِلَيْهِ إِلَّا بَعْدَ الْفَنَاءِ But to this level, I mean, look, this is a difficult level. He says, it's not possible to reach this level unless you annihilate yourself. Which means that you kill yourself, to, to use a very crude word here, you kill your nafs. You don't kill yourself. There's no suicide here. It's just killing the nafs, the ego. To not want anything for the sake of selfish reason. Only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This has to be, when you give yourself fully to Allah, then all of these things will become much more manifest. Which is to eliminate all of the blameworthy traits of the heart. So you have no jealousy anymore. You don't get jealous when somebody else has got something better than you have. Which is a major issue for a lot of people today, especially in the times of prosperity. Even when people have difficulty, there's always going to be disparity among people. When it doesn't matter anymore what somebody else has. It just matters, where am I? You never compare yourself to others and want more of the dunya because of that. You don't get angry for yourself like the Prophet ﷺ. He used to get angry for religion, but if anybody acted foolishly with him, he would actually get, become more relaxed. It was really strange. He would just become more relaxed. And that, that's really difficult to do. It's really difficult to do. See, I've explained uh, in Ramadan, I was discussing miserliness. In several places, I discussed it. The one thing that you have to understand is that there's some people who are, uh, who are naturally have a lot of anger. They get angry quickly. Some people who are naturally tight, right, and uh, not very generous by nature. There's some people who just love to eat, right? They have a lot of desire, right? just by nature. There's some people, you'll see it in children, they like to have nice things. There's a desire to have nice things. I want to dress well. And some kids don't even care, right? You have some girls who are like, no, I want to, you know, I want this and I want that and I'll put this. You know, even when they're young, they want to. And then there's other girls that are like, I don't even care, you know. Boys, same thing. So, when you've got that, that's nature. You're not going to be punished for that. You're not even accountable for that. That's the way Allah made you. Right? If, you're, if, you, if you look among your own brothers and sisters maybe, or your uncles and aunts, some of them are just more generous than others. They're more willing to give than others. One kid, he's got his last sweet, like his last heavenly delights, jelly, whatever you call it, uh, sweet, or your last rollo or whatever they say, and he's willing to give it to you. And there's the other kid who's just started the packet, he's got loads in there, and when you ask him, he'll give you one, if you're lucky, or he may not even give you one. For somebody to give you their last sweet, unless they're sick of it, right? but sweets, you know, for kids, you don't get sick, they don't get sick of sweets. Right? The last sweet, there's a difference, the two brothers, one is willing to give you and the other one isn't. Masha, you'll say, this one is, mashallah, very open-hearted, very generous, and this one isn't. Who made him like that? They're both from the same family. It's just nature. Nobody can be punished for nature because that's how Allah makes you. But when you carry on acting on that nature and it goes against the Sharia, that's when you get punished. So if I am naturally stingy by nature, which I think I am, and I then continue, I then act on that nature. I don't give my zakat, I don't give sadaqatul fitr, I don't spend on others. When we go out to eat, I don't pay, I'm always disappearing when the bill comes. Do you see what I'm saying? Then I am now acting on my nature, I'm going against what the religion requires of me to spend and go against that, and what common decency does. See the difference? So we are all created on different natures. Some of us actually may be very generous, but we've got an anger problem. So that, the problem there is twofold. Curb your anger and make sure that your generosity doesn't lead to israf. Israf means overspending in where you're not supposed to spend. That's another problem. 
So can you see how Allah has created us at different levels? Just because you're very generous doesn't mean it's a good thing. Yes, it is a good thing because generally miserly people find it more tough because by spending you can learn, earn a lot of reward and you can make a lot of people happy. But then your problem or your challenge now is to make sure that you don't spend in the wrong way. person who hardly gets angry is very cool. You may want them on your team because you know they're, they're, they're going to be a yes man. Right? But then what kind of a life does that guy live? When he gets walked over all the time. Can't even stand up for himself. So can you see their challenge? They're never going to get angry. You know, they're never going to get in a fight. But then people are going to say, man, you can't, he can't stand up for himself. And the person who gets angry a lot of the time, well, you may want him on your team because you may want him to do the hard work for you. To go and say things when you need to say them. But then he has to be careful that he doesn't rub people up the wrong way. Or he doesn't do it, do it when it's wrong. So by nature, whatever we are, Allah has created all of us different. Just like children will be all maybe different. It's about how then we moderate that. And it's the dhikr that helps us with that. So, so now, if you are, by nature, an angry person will realize that, that that's fine, but I need to curb my <coughs> anger. And if by nature, I am stingy, I need to be more open. So where there's an appeal for some help, let me pull out money and give it to, to remedy my, my stinginess. So that I'm not punishing for, for exercising my stinginess. Like Allah says in the Quran, Hasidin idha hasad. One is that envy is in your heart, but you don't express it and you try to curb it. You're not going to be punished for that because that's just the thought that's coming into your mind. But if you like to entertain it and indulge it and then you do something based on your envy, your hasad, then, you'll be, then, then you're sinful. And that's why we're sought to, told to seek protection from such a person. Or I mean, sharri hasidin idha hasad from the evil of the envious one when he exercises his envy. Otherwise, as long as the envy stays in their mind, then that's fine. He can suffer. Muawiyah anhu said that there is no more, there is no vice that is more just than envy. It kills the person it's, that holds it before it kills the person who's envious of. Because if I'm envious of you, then I'm going to burn inside you. You won't even know. Yes, if I start acting on that, then that's even worse. Then you'll get affected. But otherwise, I'm just going to burn inside. And I can't even do anything. So it sorts the person out himself before it sorts out the other person. So he says, the way to reach this high level of Siddiqiyya and Wilayatul Kubra is to basically take care of the nafs. And that is by removing all of its um, blameworthy attributes. Hatta la tasira multafitatan ila shay'in minha such that you will not feel attracted by anything. You'll never be distracted away from Allah by anything. But tazhadaha, in fact, you will make a, a conscious decision to re, re, renounce, these, uh, renounce these things that I'm not interested. Kama tazhada akl al jifati mathalan. The same way that you would the same way that you would abandon, I mean forget abandon, you would shun you would feel it an affront to you that somebody tells you to eat dead meat, carrion, a corpse. The same way you would shun something like that, you would shun uh, wanting more of the dunya. You, you'll you'll want to eat, obviously you have to eat. It doesn't mean that you just stay hungry. No, it means you do all of that, but you you just don't focus on that. That's a difficult one. That, that That's a very difficult one. So... Um, he carries on, he talks about the he, he talks about the sifatuha al madhmuma He says, and the the blameworthy traits of the heart are the following Hasad, which is jealousy, Hikt, which is rancor in the heart for people, just this feeling of hatred for people. And no reason whatsoever. You don't hate them for the sake of religion. You just hate them because for petty things. If you find yourself just Full of hate, as they say. I mean, that's the it's a big topic of today, isn't it? Hate and love. You just find yourself hating on people for no reason. 
right, for small reasons. I mean, you're, it's very difficult for you to even justify because you're going to think you're justified in hating them. You need somebody else to tell you, man, you're, you're full of hate. Because we won't, we'll, we'll think we're justified. This is what the difficulty is. Right? We need others to tell us, man, you're full of hate. You don't need to. Like, if I am hating people and everybody else around me doesn't hate them, then that's a big sign that I'm probably wrong. I can't be the most knowledgeable person about everything. Maybe I should be ignoring things. وَحُبُّ الْجَاهِ Wanting fame. Love of fame. That's another... And that, that love of fame, you know, whether that be in your company, in your institution, whatever it may be. Among your friends. I mean, you bake cakes well, mashallah, but you just want to be the best because you want to have that fame. If you just want to be a best because you just want to be a good cook, alhamdulillah, mubarak to you. But if you're doing it because you just want to be known as the best. Wasit. Again, same thing, fame among people. Well, Mahmida to be praised. Wariyasa, that you want to lead everything. Was shahwat and other uh, other desires. Well, kibr, arrogance, riya, which means ostentation. Well, ujub, self conceit, narcissism, nifaq, hypocrisy, gurur, just being deceived, and bughdu ahadim min al khalk, just basically disliking Allah's creation for no religious reason somebody just told me that there was a big scholar who had come to the UK I think it was last year or something so there's another person who's just recently kind of been studying right? so he comes along and he talks to the particular sheikh who had invited that sheikh from another country why do you invite him for? It's like, why? Like, you know, why, why, why shouldn't I invite him? Because he's got so much contribution and people will benefit from him in this country. Oh, he's, well, what's so great about it? I can write like him. You know, I have the same kind of research. Well, well, what's the big deal? And it was just very surprising that somebody who would even claim to be a scholar would say this. But that just shows you that they're not there yet. Mashallah, they, they're probably very intelligent, so they've learned a number of things. And when you learn things, knowledge always rises, because knowledge is always elevated, right? In the world, we respect knowledge. We respect anybody who's got knowledge about anything. We respect them. So when you get that knowledge, knowledge by its very self pushes you up. If your spirituality doesn't keep you at bay, then that knowledge will actually push you out of the roof. That, this is a, a problem for scholars, for example, or wannabe scholars. So this guy is not known to be a, an accomplished scholar. He's, he's still a student in a sense. But he thinks he knows so much because he can write well maybe, right? knows a few things, that this big scholar who's actually proven it, who's a big lecturer in a major university, and he's benefited literally, he's got several books to his name, Right, he's a very critical scholar. He was complaining, why you bring him along? I was just shocked when I heard that. I said, how can somebody even say that? Even if I disagree with the scholar, I should say that you shouldn't call him because he, maybe he, he, I don't agree with his opinions. That's for fair, right? on principle. But to say, why do you call him? I can do the same thing. Say, like, why don't you call me? Subhanallah. So if people of scholarship people who are studying it can affect them like that if they don't have a proper understanding of how this works then can you imagine the rest of us we won't even know what's going on we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help in this regard inshallah we'll carry on in the next session but that the, just to conclude is saying that these are the benefits that you will actually attain through dhikr the more dhikr that you do then the more inshallah you will be able to receive of course the dhikr that you do needs to be done in a guided way when you want to do a lot of dhikr, because sometimes it can actually work out that you, you, you need to temper it, you need to understand how to do it, and the times to do it, and what dhikr to do, etc. Because sometimes it can actually, uh, it's like taking too much medicine sometimes. So you have to be careful as well. Wa akhir da'wana, Allahumma anta salam, wa minka salam, tabarak bi adil jalali wal ikram. Allahumma ya hayyu ya qayyum, bi rahmatika nastaghir. 
اللهم يا حنان يا منان لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين جز الله عنا محمد ما هو أهله اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وعافنا واهدنا وارزقنا اللهم اغفر لأمة سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات اللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا ولمشايخنا ولأساتذتنا ولطلابنا ولإخواننا ولأخواتنا ولأزواجنا ولأولادنا ولأقاربنا ولأستقائنا ولكل من له حق علينا ولكل من أوصانا بالدعاء اللهم اغفر لموتان المسلمين الذين شهدونك بالوحدانية وماتوا على ذلك اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاذك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله اللهم أصلح لنا شأننا كله ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين اللهم رب زدنا علما نافعا ورزقا واسعا وعملا متقبلا وشفاء من كل داء اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع وقلب لا يخشع ونفس لا تشبع وعين لا تدمع ودعاء لا يستجاب له اللهم ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا لنتقين إماما اللهم ارزقنا حبك وحب من ينفعنا حبه عندك اللهم اجعلنا ذكارين لك ذكارين لك شكارين لك اللهم إنا نسألك تمام العافية ودوام العافية والشكر على العافية اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من الجنون والجذام والبرس والسيء الأسقام اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من فتنة المحيا والممات اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من فتنة المسيح الدجال اللهم اغفر وارحم وتجاوز Oh Allah, we ask for your mercy and your blessings. Oh Allah, we ask that you allow the blessings of the previous Ramadan that has just passed. Oh Allah, we ask that you allow us to continue to benefit in its barakat and to not lose everything that we have attained. Oh Allah, we ask that this coming year until the next Ramadan and for the rest of our life that you take care of us and you look after us and you preserve us and you bless us. Oh Allah, have your mercy on us. O oh Allah, bring us closer to you after this Ramadan than we've ever been before the Ramadan. O oh Allah, we ask that you protect us and our children and you grant us the karima la ilaha illallah. Allow us to die on faith. Allow dhikr to become part of our life and allow it to be the source of the removal of our problems, our issues. O oh Allah, and for imbibing ourselves with the goodness and to be close to you. O oh Allah, grant us the maqam of wilaya and siddiqiyya. O oh Allah, we know this is asking for you a lot and we don't have the, the a'mal and the, the efforts that are required for this. But O oh Allah, we ask that you uh, help us ascend and you escalate us towards this. O oh Allah, bless all of us and do not allow any one of us here to turn away f- without being forgiven. O oh Allah, except from us. Subhanahu wa rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun alayhi wa